It doesn't take much time on YouTube before you find out that a lot of the content about The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is negative. And unfortunately, the algorithm doesn't discern between truth and falsehood for you. So I took the top six creators that are negative towards the church and I combined them together for a total of 117 million views. And as a content creator who believes in the restoration, I worry that the tidal wave of hostility coming towards the church is going to eclipse the beautiful light of the restoration. And the one thing all these channels have in common is they have a strict reverence for a document called the CES letter. The CES. The CES, that's it. The CES letter. The CES letter. The CES letter, somewhere between 13 and 15,000 people um, have reached out to Jeremy personally. So you might be wondering, what is the CES letter? Well, in 2013, a man by the name of Jeremy Runnels published a letter online that was sent to the director of the church education system, or CES, hence the name, the CES letter. In the introduction to the letter, Jeremy states the following, I'm just going to be straightforward in sharing my concerns. Obviously, I'm a disaffected member who lost his testimony, so it's no secret which side I'm on at the moment. He goes on to say, I've decided to put down in writing just about all the major concerns I have. So that's what the CES letter is. It puts forth claims about the Book of Mormon, the First Vision, the Book of Abraham, polygamy, and just about any subject having to do with church history that Jeremy saw as problematic. So a decision has been made. Uh, I have excommunicated the LDS church. <laughs> So no matter what your relationship is with the CES letter, some of you have read it and you believe it. Some of you have read it and you're not sure yet. Some of you have never even heard of it, or some of you may have heard of it, but you're scared of it. This is gonna be the place for you because what we're gonna do in this series is we're gonna check the sources of the sources of the CES letter. Now, when I first read it, I read it and I was like, this is so well organized. It, it's, it reads like a collegiate uh, dissertation and I read it and I just took it all at face value. But then, I read the debunkings of it and then I took all those at face value. And so what I'm gonna to try to do here is not take anything at face value, but we're gonna dissect every single argument having to do with the Book of Mormon in the CES letter. Hopefully all together, come closer to what the truth is. So with that, let's dive into it. Okay, so what we're gonna do is, holy cow, my eye bags are bad. And those are brought to you by Lainey Jane Paul, my baby daughter who had a rough night last night. But anyways, we're not gonna read the introduction to the CES letter. If you wanna do that, you can find that in the description. But we are just going to go into the Book of Mormon sections because this is a Book of Mormon channel. So we're gonna start off right here with these quotes that are in the CES letter. The first one is, the Book of Mormon is the keystone of our testimony. Just as the arch crumbles if the keystone is removed, so does all the church stand or fall with the truthfulness of the Book of Mormon. President Ezra Taft Benson, money quote. The next one, everything in the church, everything, rises or falls on the truthfulness of the Book of Mormon and by implication the prophet Joseph Smith's account of how it came forth. It sounds like a sudden death proposition to me. Either the Book of Mormon is what the prophet Joseph said it is, or this church and its founder are false, fraudulent, a deception from the first instance onward. So those are pretty good quotes. And I think it explains exactly why we're just getting into the Book of Mormon sections of the CES letter. One, because we're a Book of Mormon channel, but two, because it really is the keystone of our religion. All right, so the first thing that it talks about, it says 17th century italics. Quick message to the critics. We're not skipping the 17th century King James edition errors part of the CES letter. We just want to give it the due diligence it deserves. So right now we're going to put it to the side. So stand by for that. And we're just going to get right into the King James italics part of the CES letter. When King James translators were translating the KJV Bible between 1604 and 1611, they would occasionally put in their own words, put in their own words into the text to make the English more readable. That's, that is funny, that's ironic right there because there's an extra word in there that makes it so the English is unreadable, but he's talking about them putting words in to make it readable. That is funny. We know exactly what these words are because they're italicized in the KJV Bible. What are the 17th century italicized words doing in the Book of Mormon? Word for word? What does this say about the Book of Mormon being an ancient record? And then he goes on to read Isaiah 9, 1. 
uh, and I'll just read one of them. It says, Nevertheless, the dimness shall not be such as was in her vexation, when at the first he lightly afflicted the land of Zebulon and the land of Naphtali, and afterward did more grievously afflict her by the way of the sea beyond Jordan in Galilee of the nations. Okay, so as you can see, he highlights shall be and by in that, and then he highlights shall be and by in the next verse as well. And so like the insinuation here is that those italicized words are the translator's own words. Why do they show up also in the Book of Mormon? Okay, so before I really dive into this, my initial reaction is there's just kind of a misunderstanding of what translation is here. Like every single word is the translator's own words. It's not just italicized words because that's what translation is. Because, and I'm not trying to insult you or Jeremy or anyone, your intelligence. I'm just going to break down what translation is very simply, just kind of lay the ground floor for this, right? So we have abstract thoughts in our head, ideas. We cloak them with language. So in this sense, the abstract ideas of Isaiah were cloaked in the language of Hebrew. Then someone who is translating that, so they speak two different languages, they read that language and interpret it in the abstract ideas in their head, and then they recloak those abstract ideas in the other language. That is what a translator is doing, right? And so essentially every single word on the other side is the translator's own words. And it seems like in here there is like this misunderstanding that translation can happen on a word-to-word -word basis because that's just not how languages work. Like I speak Hungarian and the sentence structure between Hungarian and English is so different that it makes translation very difficult. And so it's not as clear cut as this is a one-to-one. -one. And that's my first reaction is the whole premise of this, you know, criticism just doesn't seem to have weight in and of itself, even if it all holds true. So I'm going to take a break, dig into this, and we shall find what I learned. Okay, done researching this. Let me show you what I learned. All right, so the first thing that I ended up doing was I took my King James Version of the Bible and I got the same version that was available to Joseph Smith at the time as well. And I looked at, I double checked those italicized words and I noticed an inconsistency. The first thing is the way that the CS letter portrays it in that in the paragraph above is it says it's word for word. And then you see how he bolded all the italicized words and that's just not true. So first off, in the King James Bible, her is italicized right here. So it says, more grievously afflict her by the way of the sea. So that's italicized in the King James Version, and it doesn't even show up in the second Nephi one. So already we see that the idea of it being a word for word copy just doesn't hold up from just reading the Bible and the Book of Mormon next to each other. So the second thing I checked out was what do the other translations of the Bible say? Do they use similar words uh, that are highlighted here in this argument? And the answer is yes, many of them do. And one of them even predates the King James Version of the Bible. So it's the Geneva Bible and it uses the words shall, be, and by just like the King James does. Is that saying that the King James translators just copied the Geneva Bible? Or is it just showing that the nature of translation from Hebrew to English is very similar no matter who the translators are? Once again, as, as my initial reaction said, I, I think this has less to do about whether or not it's an ancient document or if the Book of Mormon is legit and more to do about the nature of translation. If the King James translators were good translators and Joseph Smith is a good translator, you would expect the translations to be, if not exactly the same, very similar. And that is the case for these two verses that are pointed out by Jeremy Reynolds. But this is not the end of the argument. He still has more, so let's read it. So it says, the above example, 2 Nephi 19.1, dated in the Book of Mormon to be around 550 BC, quotes nearly verbatim from the 1611 AD translation of Isaiah 9.1. So this is, this is interesting, right? So in the first paragraph, he says word for word, but then it goes from word to word to nearly verbatim from the 1611 AD translations of Isaiah 9.1. So it's just like really weird, um, including the translator's italicized words. Additionally, the Book of Mormon describes the sea as the Red Sea. The problem with this is that A, Christ quoted Isaiah in Matthew 4, 14 through 15 and did not mention the Red Sea. All right, let's double check that. Matthew 4, 14 through 15 that it might be fulfilled that which was spoken by Isaiah or Isaiah the prophet saying 
the land of Zebulon and the land of Nephtalim by the way of the sea beyond Jordan, Galilee of Gentiles. Okay, so he is quoting that, but yes, it doesn't match up. It's, uh, he doesn't say Red Sea in there. B, Red Sea is not found in any source manuscripts. Okay, and C, the Red Sea is 250 miles away. Okay, so the, the first, my first reaction to this is, like this completely undermines the initial paragraph. This says that this is a, you know, a word for word plagiarism of the Bible. That Joseph Smith just has his Bible in one hand and he's reading it behind his curtain and he's reading it off to Oliver Cowdery or whoever. Um, so it, can, it seems to like switch it, which isn't really a good, like you pick one or the other if you're going to go with the argument. You do both of them and it cancels each of them out, which is kind of strange. But... We already checked, A is correct. Christ did not say Red Sea. B, Red Sea is not found in any source manuscripts. You need to check that out. And C, the Red Sea is 250 miles away. So let's go find out. Five hours later. All right, so now let's look into these three claims about the Red Sea. So claim A, we already verified. Uh, Jesus did not in fact say that it was the Red Sea. He just said the sea. The second claim is that it doesn't show up any source manuscripts. And so I actually checked that out. I looked. And in the Masoretic text, which is like kind of like the authoritative Hebrew Bible text, it's right. It doesn't say Red Sea, it just says Sea. And then also in the Dead Sea Scroll, which is the oldest text of Isaiah that we know of, it also doesn't say Red Sea. Now it leads into the third claim, which is that the Red Sea is 250 miles away from the area that it's talking about. So I actually went and I got this photocopy of a map um, that is owned by a friend of mine named Jim Gee. And it is a map from the original King James Bible. And I found the lands of Naphtali and Zebulon. And it's up in this northern area. Now the Red Sea is all the way down here. And so it's right, it's 250 miles away. So what it's talking about in these verses, I think it's almost certainly not the Red Sea and probably the Sea of Galilee. And so we have this apparent mistake in the Book of Mormon. So what do we do with that? Well, I will point out that in the title page of the Book of Mormon, it says that we should be sure to not condemn the things of God because of the mistakes of man. And that there probably are going to be mistakes of men in the Book of Mormon. Whether that's on, you know, Mormon side when he was compiling everything, there's mistakes, or in the translation side. So the way translation worked is Joseph Smith would read aloud 10 to 15 words at a time. And his scribe would copy those down all at once. So in this process, there was plenty of room where mistakes could be made, whether it was the scribe mishearing Joseph Smith, or later on when the manuscript was turned into the printer's manuscript, there were even there are even discrepancies between there. Now it's important to point out that Red Sea is mentioned nine times in the Book of Mormon prior to these verses. And C is mentioned 20 times. But every single time C is mentioned in the Book of Mormon prior to this, it is about generalities. It's not talking about a specific C. But every single time a specific C is talked about, especially in the old world, it is talking about the Red Sea. And so hypothesizing about this is that Oliver Cowdery very well either misheard or could have made a scribal correction while Joseph Smith was dictating these verses putting Red Sea in there because remember it's talking about a specific sea in a specific area in the old world. And so that gives you one possibility of why that mistake exists in the Book of Mormon. All right, so now we're on our last part of this section, talking about the italicized words. Um, and it's Malachi 3.10 and 3 Nephi 24.10. So I'll just read one of them, and it says, And pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. So once again, the bolded are the italicized parts. So the parts that are, you know, quote unquote, the translator's words, not the actual words in the, um, in the Hebrew Bible. So... Once again, he says, in the above example, the KJV translators added seven italicized words to their English translation, which are not found in the source Hebrew manuscripts. Why does the Book of Mormon, which is supposed to have been completed by Moroni over 1400 years prior, contain the exact identical seven italicized words of 17th century translators? So I'm not, we're not going like, to go any more deep into this really because it, it kind of goes along with what we are, have already said. For the sake of the argument, let's read it in the way that Jeremy says it should be written, which is a one-to-one, -one, if that even exists, Hebrew translation from Hebrew to English. And pour you out a blessing that not enough. It just doesn't make sense. It's unintelligible in English. 
And so if a translator did that, they would be a bad translator. They need to make the abstract ideas in Hebrew make sense in English. So that's all I got on that one. Next episode, we'll be going, we'll just be continuing into the, mis, the quote unquote mistranslations in the Book of Mormon. And uh, yeah, I hope that you guys enjoyed this. Please, if you have any other insights to share or anything that you, any bad arguments that you saw I made, please share them in the comments. I want to hear that. And until next time, stay curious and hungry.